no matter what, the universe is laughing at you. Like, let's say I lost everything I have right now. Like, literally, I lost everything I have. Like, nobody knows me in the world. I have zero followers, zero students. Gigi left me. I have no money, no house. I'm sitting in the street, right? Let's say at that point, like, I think I would get over it pretty quickly, like in a matter of a day or two. Welcome everyone. Today I have with me Sunny. And Sunny, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience, who you are and what do you do? Thanks, Ankit, for having me. My name is Sun, uh, Sun Yi. I'm a storytelling coach. I have a community called Night Owl Nation where I teach people storytelling. Um, and we also practice storytelling together as a community. I also run an agency called Night Owls. Uh, it's a digital agency, uh, mostly doing uh, websites and uh, branding work for personal brands. Awesome. So I had this question for you, and I've been thinking about this question a lot. Uh, that I need to ask you this question. And <laughs> that would be like, uh, why do humans love stories so much? Hmm. I mean, I don't know. I guess, uh, <laughs> I guess when... When I hear a story, I'm, I'm I'm just making this up. When I hear a story, I put myself in that person's shoe. Like when I watch a movie or, you know what I mean? So I think that automatically makes us like remember it and, and kind of see from their point of view or something like that. So, but you know, like everything that we've ever learned was from a story. Like... Mm -hmm. Um, like the Bible is a great example of that, right? <laughs> um, everything in the Bible, every lesson in the Bible is taught through a story because, you know, it, it's they've proven over time that 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 works and it sticks in people's head, and you know. Yeah. Well, and, and I went deep on this rabbit hole, like how important the stories are to us, and mm -hmm. I think. It's pretty much a base of our identity. Like every story makes our own identity. And mm -hmm. let me expand a bit on that. Like the story of who you are itself is a collection of many different stories. Like I'm from this nation and each nation has its nation building story. And I'm from this religion. So every religion has a backstory. And that's what I found very important. Like stories play a much more important role into our lives than we do credit to it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, really I didn't think of it that way. But I, I mean, I, I've heard stories from all different cultures and all different languages and things like that, but there's actually not, there's much more similarities than differences in those stories. Like the, the kind of stories that I grew up hearing, like Korean stories, there's actually like a exact version of that story here in the US too. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, for example, uh, you know, during the Korean War, there was this girl who, um, who, who like fought against the the you know communist like regime, and like she she held her ground, and at the end, like she she suffered from it. But you know, like in the U.S., we also have the stories of like Rosa Parks, and like so. I feel like the, those characters are exist all over the world. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it, it does make sense. And uh, I was trying to find this common thread, like what makes a story a good story? So what is according to you? I guess um, it's two things, right? So when we watch a movie or something like that, the entertaining factor, they always say it's like the setup conflict and the resolution. There has to be a conflict, right? So, and that's something like, um, you know, I'm trying to like get this girl to fall in love with me, right? But then like something keeps going in the way, like like somebody like there's like a love triangle and like whatever it is, like and then I'm trying to like there's that superficial one, right? But then there's also an underlying story of inner transformation because a lot of times like, and I think that's what makes the story because almost every story has the conflict, right? Okay, oh I'm gonna yeah. win this basketball game, right? Like Rocky, right? I'm gonna win this 
uh, boxing match or whatever it is. And at the end, some, they either the resolution is they either get it or they don't get it, right? But whether they get it or not, the reason why even the Rocky Rocky lost, like the reason why that was still a good movie is because there was an underlying lesson that was being taught, right? And and a lot of times I think um, like this. Have you seen the last Rocky movie? The no, Creed I three? haven't. No. So my favorite part of that movie was actually at the end after he won spoiler alert <laughs> he goes into the he goes into the locker room and he actually even though this is like his enemy they reconcile together right and that was like the the most beautiful moment of the movie so like the example that i always give is like uh if you look at super bad right super mm-hmm. bad is such a great example of a good story because it's two teenagers trying to get late and trying to get alcohol. And that's their goal. The conflict is like, yeah. every time they do it, they get, oh, the cops find their, they, oh, they get a fake ID and then the cops find it. And then they're, oh, where do we get the money from? And then like, there's a hurdle after, a like, conflict after conflict after. And, you know, finally they, they, they reach that point. But the last thing is them kind of um, having a sleepover and looking at each other and talking. And they, they have this, this deep conversation about like, you know, I'm just about one of them going away to college. And there's there's this tension between them because, you know, what's going to happen to our friendship and things like that. And they had to kind of learn that, you know, we, we're still going to be friends. And they had to get over that. Right. And that was a real true lesson that was happening all throughout. So most I, I feel like the best movies have that they have the the, the set of conflict resolution. Yes. But there's an inner transformation that's happening inside the character. And that's what really makes a great movie. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I had watched uh, Pulp Fiction. And uh, I, was tr- I had recently learned like the, there's a hero's journey arc. Mm-hmm. And I was trying so hard to find a hero's journey in that movie. And it was really tricky for me. And I think... It was intentional that there's no clear journey, but uh, on the surface level, there is. And I'm still struggling to find it. But, yeah. I haven't seen that movie in so long, so I'm trying to uh, figure out. I'm trying to remember it. Because there's like multiple stories going on there too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I can't really speak on it because it's. It, I haven't seen I, I just don't remember. Uh, <laughs> remember? Yeah, it's a very wonderful movie, to be honest. Yeah. And uh, yeah, talking about the inner transformation, one thing which struck with me was when we were going through that uh, assignment, like uh, looking at your your story from a different perspective, like having yourself as a victim and as a villain and as an observer. So there was a very important thing you said, like all, all this practice is going to do is help you in like... Uh, uh, fighting your ego, like death of your ego, and I found it like very spiritual. So, mm-hmm. was it intended, or do you think like it automatically is, is a part of process, like the ego death happens through the storytelling and practicing the storytelling? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think ego is not just from storytelling. Like, I think we have ego all the time, right? Like, that's the mm-hmm. reason why, you know, the the one of the reasons why people don't post on Instagram. Is because of ego. It's because, oh, what if I post this and it's not perfect and everybody people judge me or people don't like it or something like that? Who cares, right? Well, the reason why we care is because we tied our identity to that, right? It's like, oh, yeah. this post is me, <laughs> right? Oh, this business, this brand is me. So when people start criticizing it, they're criticizing me, right? And all of that comes from ego, right? Whereas in... Mm-hmm. If somebody else posted the same thing and they criticized them, you you wouldn't even care less, right? <laughs> right? If it was someone else, so you you can't look at yourself like you look at a third person, right? And that's why, like, I we do that exercise is because, you know, one of the things I had to learn early on in in when I started my agency, it, you know, I didn't know how easy I had it. Like when I worked in a company. And I would design like some whatever I want, blah, 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 and I would give it to the project manager or whatever. 
or account the account manager and the account manager has to deliver it to the client right and they're the ones that are talking to the client and what, what's happening there is that account manager is defending my design and then when the mm -hmm. client comes in and bashes it he's not telling me everything that the client said he's just telling me what needs to be said so to to manage my ego right yeah. and then he has to manage the client's ego like in between so he's 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 filtering a lot of that because if it was me and the client talking directly, we would just scream at each other and we're like, what? <laughs> like, you don't understand what you're talking about. Like, that's what's going to happen, right? So early on, I realized that in my agency, that when designers have to present their own design, they tie their ego into it. So even if the client gives you a, a, a good feedback that, that, that is true, you, it, it's going to trigger you and be like... Ugh. You don't understand like you're gonna start trying to defend your design right so yeah in the early years of night what i had to do i had to learn how to once i okay i i put my ego into it when i'm designing okay this is good, good, good good but once i'm finished with the project or the, that round of design i had to almost look at it as somebody else designed it when i presented it and I even got to a point where I presented and I would agree with the client. I was like, oh yeah, that looks like shit. Oh no, yeah, that was a, that, uh, like you, you, I started looking at my own design objectively. And once I started looking at my own design objectively, then it was easier for me to see the flaws. And that's when I actually really started becoming a much better designer. Because like, if you look at our websites, right? Some, something that very commonly happens is when the the websites that we design when other design other designers look at it they're like oh okay it's, it's, it's okay it's okay it's good <laughs> but they're not like wowed okay mm -hmm. because you know they visually they've seen something better or they can do something better like visually right and that's how i was i would like i would do these fancy designs that are like state of the art blah 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 that doesn't work in real life Right? That doesn't work because it doesn't sell this product or it doesn't uh, communicate this message. But once I started like doing that, my design quality actually went down, meaning it wasn't as uh, revolutionary a bleeding edge design. It was more <laughs> kind of plain, <laughs> you know, more design that people were used to. But there were other aspects to, to it, like making sure that this button stands out more, making sure that this message works like... There were other aspects to it that other designers like cannot even see the beauty of that, right? But because we started to remove our ego, what would happen is we would deliver that design and we would launch it. And even though the designer is like, oh, I don't know that that design, this design, that, that one doesn't look that much better. It's about the same. But performance-wise, when the, the customers, the audience goes to go to visit this site, this this the art designs will perform hundred times better than this. Why? Because we went into the psyche of that customers and we we're giving them exactly what they want that this person doesn't even see because they're just so focused on the design. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it reminds me of that. Like I was watching a VFS break breakdown. Uh, there's a YouTube channel called Cor Corridor Digital, and I was watching a VFS breakdown, and they said, like, good VFX is never noticed. Like you will not never notice like there's a VFX and bad VFX stands out like a sore thumb. So that's a really important. And even in the websites, someone had said to me like uh, award winning websites are never, mostly never functional. Like they look pretty, oh, they, yeah, yeah. it's a beautiful experience, but yeah. they never function in the real world. So that was very interesting observation. Yeah, like yeah. A lot of times when we deliver websites to clients, the clients are not blown away when we launched the site. When we first deliver the site and we launch it, they actually are not blown away. They're like, okay, yeah, it's good, whatever, right? Like you, like you said, it, it, it takes a lifetime to make something simple. <laughs> Making yeah. something complicated is easy. It actually is a lot more work to make something simple, right? So they're like, oh, simple, whatever. But then usually what happens is like a year later, two years later, they come back and they're like, oh, son, we want to add this. We're like they come for more, more work. And that's when they say, you know what, son? Like, I didn't realize it back then. But you thought of every little thing that <laughs> we, we didn't think of. And you, 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 won't, you have no idea how many customers come to us and say, hey, 
uh, like I I bought from you because your website had this thing that they haven't even thought of, but we thought of it. We thought of the ten steps ahead. <laughs> so those kind of things you can't visually see it until you put it out there and you you get the feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to move to another different topic, other side related. And I've been thinking about this a lot, like in this um, modern day where we have AI generating art and everything and mixing everything. So how would you define creativity in this modern sense? I don't know, because I don't really consider myself a creative person. Because I, I'm, I'm not, I said this before, but I don't have a creative bone in my body. <laughs> Meaning, uh, when I was young, uh like my dad used to always say son you're so great at copying but you, you know you're like you can't come up with your original stuff right and i was like always offended by that because i wanted to be a designer i wanted to be a creative person <laughs> but like i just wasn't right so even when i started design what i did was i copied designs like pixel by pixel and then i would like tweak something and like you know, people always made fun of me. It's like, oh, that looks like this. Or that, you know what I mean? That's how I learned. But over time, what happened was after doing like a hundred of these, I, I recognized pattern of like, okay, when I use this font with this thickness and this much spacing and it, like I reverse engineer design so that I, I recognize pattern of like certain things that needs to be done to make it look more elegant versus more bold versus more fun versus more uh, friendly. Versus, you know what I mean? So I started to recognize those things, and so that's how I did it, right? So I think, like, I'm I'm more of a commercial designer in the sense that, like, I, I think what I know how to do is deliver what needs to be delivered, like, communicate it, right? Creative, what I would say is, like, what Rick Rubin does, right? Like, what I said about Rick Rubin. Like, he'll work, like, I know some musicians, like, okay, for example, you know, I, I've been to these, like, uh, uh, self-help kind of, like, spiritual, like, place, like, uh, seminars and things like that where they just say oh just get up and dance <laughs> right and I, I just can't do that like I see people like doing all this crazy shit I just can't right or they'll they'll just like oh they'll say oh just just journal whatever comes to your mind like I, I'm just staying at a blank page like uh, I don't, I, nothing's coming out of me <laughs> right or like even when you when you play music like they're like oh just see what comes out of you Nothing ever just comes out of me <laughs> because I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very analytical brain. Like everything has to make sense in my head before it comes out of me, right? So in that sense, I'm not creative at all, but I know people that are like that. And usually those people, I think, comes out with something and then they don't even know what it means. They don't know why it came out like that. They don't know why. Banksy doesn't know why I drew it like that. I don't, I don't know why I drew this. Like, like they don't know. Until like maybe somebody else interprets it and you look back years later and be like, oh, I think I was trying to express this or something like that. And it came like they they can't really explain it. Right. But so I, I'm not like that at all. I'm more like so if you look at Adele, you know, like Adele has that song that, you know, the old song that goes, never mind. I just, never mind. I'll find someone like you. Uh, like so if you look at that song, there's a YouTube video that actually breaks that entire thing down. And it scientifically breaks down, okay, the note here, there's a half step here, and, da, 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 da. and when that happens, it triggers the brain to go into sadness. And then that with her voice, raspy voice, and then this, like, it, it scientifically breaks down exactly why that song makes people cry, okay? And, and that's how K-pop works. K-pop has reverse engineered scientifically, and that's why they do well, right? They, they look at the numbers and analytics. But Adele wasn't sitting there trying to like calculate that shit. It just came out of her. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And then we can reverse engineer yeah. it. And so that's, I think, the difference between like those create. That's creative. What I'm doing is I'm not really creating. Um, I'm just reverse engineering. <laughs> Even stories yeah. like like that's the reason why I can teach storytelling better than anyone else. Because everybody else goes there like, oh, just see what comes out of you. Like, <laughs> and then like uh, what comes out of them is shit. <laughs> right so yeah. but then, and then it doesn't work the story doesn't work but I, I i've been able to reverse engineer what makes a good story blah, blah 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 so i can give you the rubric i can give you exactly what's going on what's wrong with you like and that's why it works you know 
<laughs> yeah, I completely relate with you. I don't have a creative bone in me as myself. And sometimes when I'm in this creative community, I feel like an imposter. Like even when they are critiquing some art, I'm like, I don't see what you're seeing here. I don't find Yeah, you know what happened? I, I used to be just like that too. Every time I was around creatives, I felt like an imposter. But give it like another 10 years. Now I'm at a point where I go into a room like that with all the creatives. Now I'm like, I'm the only non-imposter. Every one of you are the imposter. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm I'm true to I'm true to what I I I think I'm true to what I am, right? I know I'm not that. I'm no I know I'm not, you know, whatever that you, you're saying is, but when I a lot of times when I talk to creatives, yes, there are some true artists where the art just comes out of them. But most agencies, most designers that you talk to, it's not. A lot of them are not that. They just they just think that by getting some tattoos and, you know, <laughs> You know, like so just wearing some designer, like some trendy thing with their, you know, weird haircut and with their beard and their Starbucks cup. That's that's what they think makes a designer. No, that's not what makes a designer. You know, <laughs> like you can pretend like they like the idea of being in the design industry. Yeah, that's what I would say. I, I truly, truly, truly love design and the, the whole reverse engineering, the whole like I truly love that, you know. Yeah. That's very interesting. Uh, yeah. Oh, I forgot about what I was going to ask you. I think, yeah. I'm still stuck on this. Do you consider yourself a spiritual person? I'm so not spiritual at all. I'm the opposite. Like, like I said, it's the analytical brain side of me, right? Because I can't. I have to ask you so this. You know, like, uh, what does spiritual mean to you? Because everyone has a different, different definition. To me, spirituality is the things that science cannot explain. <laughs> like that, like religion, right? So, so that's why it really, really bothers me when people start using words like, oh, the vibration and the energy and you, have, you need to be the container. And it's like, oh, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, none of those words mean anything to me, right? Because I can't, <laughs> I can't logically fit that in, right? So... I think spiritualities are the but but that doesn't mean I don't get spirituality, right? I do understand that when I'm when I'm in a room and I'm being more present right like right now that I'm more present and I'm like really really uh zoned in on you rather than you know trying to think in my head. I know that something happens there where it it there's some sort of energy shift that happens and I I could feel it. Yes. But I I just I don't know if it can be I don't know if it's what people are saying, right? Oh, it's because of vibration. Okay. Like, yeah, you can use the word vibration, but what does that mean? To me, if I, I need a clear definition of the word, right? So to me, vibration is when things vibrate, right? Or, 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 or some way, like scientific term vibration, right? So if you start putting that together, like it, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get that, you know? So I don't consider myself a spiritual person in that sense. But I guess I, I do understand that there are things that that science cannot explain, <laughs> right? Um, so maybe I am spiritual. I just didn't use that language. <laughs> and and yeah. I think that's what actually makes me good at what I do is that, you know, somebody spiritual that does that all that woo-woo language can come to me and I can do conversation, like break down, break down, break down. And I can break it down to, okay, this is how we need to communicate it in a logical way that a normal person can understand. You know? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? The whole conversation, uh, I think, mostly influenced in the, in the Western side. Like, uh, it confuses me a lot because uh, I have studied science and I know specifically like what, what a vibration means or what energy means. Uh, or how there can be no positive or negative energy it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So then, f to me, energy then, is like calorie. Yeah. <laughs> calorie yeah. is energy, right? So are you talking about calorie? Like, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> or voltage? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. So it completely dissociated me. And since uh, I've been more in contact with these personal brands who are in the space, 
and someone some of these are also scientifically trained and uh, like they have st studied philosophy or, uh, or psychotherapy still they will believe in astrology so it doesn't make any sense to me i like, think actually those people are the through. worst i prefer yeah. <laughs> the spiritual teachers that's never study science and things like that i i hate people like deepak chopra because what it actually is worse for the world because now he's trying to like bring this bullshit and trying to say it's science when it's not yeah right that's actually way 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 more dangerous right than than you know like jesus or like somebody who's just like okay i'm not a scientist it's just you know what i mean i rather have that like i i don't that's why i don't really like the type of spiritual leaders that are trying to fit it into science or evidence-based things and i don't like that at all because like that, yeah. that is the whole point of spirituality is that it can't be explained with science. Don't try to explain that. <laughs> like once science can explain that, scientists scientists are the ones who are gonna measure it. Who's gonna you know who who's gonna measure the black hole or you know the dark matter and all of that? Like the expanding universe. They're, they'll let them do their job, right? Once they figure it out, figure it out. Your job is to make sense of the <laughs> things that are like and and that's like also comes from wisdom right like somehow when you read the bible or when you read like thousands of year old texts somehow they knew all of that shit somehow they knew like how you know th those those human natures and all of those things even though science wasn't there back then somehow they understood that right it's it's, it's so it's like it could be wisdom too right or something like that <laughs> yeah i have given it thought and i arrived at this conclusion like uh that our problems haven't changed over the thousands of years. It's mm -hmm. still, it's, these are still the same. We must be driving a fancier car now, like living in our well ventilated rooms, and we can fly now. But our, at the core, our problems are still the same. We're still struggling to find our purpose. We're still struggling to find meaning, and why are we here, and stuff like that. So I think that question still remains the same through the human history. Yeah, and, and science, I think that's why stoicism, like stoicism, more popular than ever right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> and this is a thousand-year-old ancient philosophy, you know. So, yeah, I mean that just goes to prove it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, I would like to ask you this: uh, Do you feel contentful in your job? Like, I'm doing a good job or a well enough job? Yeah, I guess what I. What what I try to do, and and it's been a while since I've I've been thinking like this, is the younger me used to always have high expectations, right? So th therefore, I was always miserable because <laughs> like oh no, I have to, you know what I mean? But now I think the difference is that the reason why I'm happier, I'm much more at peace, and much more content, is because. I have no expectations now. <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously, like it creeps up, right? It's like ah, I, I wish some, how many people came. Uh, how, I wish how many people came to Sunday service. Ah, uh, uh, what? How many people came to the small group? Like, of course, those things trigger me. But I, overall, I, I've learned to kind of like, okay, that's okay. Like five minutes later, okay, that's fine. We'll figure it out next month. <laughs> like whatever that is. Like I've learned to accept what the universe gives me. Like, I, I've learned to accept that, okay, no matter what, the universe is laughing at you. <laughs> How, however much you're like, oh, what, what could I have done to get more people to show up? What could I have done to get more, uh, hit the algorithm? I, I couldn't do all of that. But at, at the end of the day, I know that all those things, like, universe is laughing at me. So I guess I've, I'm, I've learned, I, I've learned to be much, much more happier because of that. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And another question on top of that. Uh, is there anything which you fear, like fear of losing anything? Like you have that? Yeah. I mean, same thing as the expectation thing, right? Like, so of course, you know, like if, you know, if I, if, if I feel like, oh, I'm going to lose money or I'm going to lose, um, you know, a friend or you lose, like maybe lose my wife or whatever it is. Obviously, like those are physical things that, that would suck. 
<laughs> right? But I guess I, I, I train myself to be like, yeah, like let's say I lost everything I have right now. Like literally, I lost everything I have. Like nobody knows me in the world. I have zero followers, zero students. Gigi left me. I have no money, no house. I'm sitting in the street, right? Let's say at that point, like I think I would get over it pretty quickly, like in a matter of a day or two. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, uh, I guess I try to live like, uh, you ever seen that movie Shawshank Redemption? Yeah. Like, so basically he's wrongly accused, right? <laughs> like he shouldn't be in jail, but he's in jail. And, and he could have spent 20 years just being resentful and going to this dark hole. But he just made the best out of the situation. And at the end, he came out on top, right? Like, so that's kind of how I look at it. Like, if, if I lose everything, that's what was supposed to happen. That's how, yeah. because I, I'm living my life. I don't know if you ever heard me say this, but I agree with Jordan Peterson on the meaning of life is the living on the edge of order and chaos, right? So like, if we're having a conversation, I'm not going to keep it safe and like, no, I don't want to say that. Like, whatever that comes to my mind, I'm going to say it. It might offend you. It might not offend you. Uh, it might piss somebody off. Like, but I'm just going to say it because I'm living in the, I'm, I'm pushing myself to the edge of order and chaos, right? And then as a result of that, what was going to happen is going to happen. So as, as long as I'm living my life like that, and then let's say I lose everything, that's what was supposed to happen. That's exactly why yeah. where I'm supposed to be, you know. So once you think of it like that, I guess it's you can get over it pretty quickly. <laughs> I think every young man, young man goes through the circle of like finding Jordan Peterson, and it's a slippery, <laughs> slippery slope because I've seen people who find Jordan Peterson now moving towards uh, Andrew Tate. Do you know 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 about him? Andrew Tate, there's a oh Andrew Tate, yeah, uh, yeah, I know him, yeah. So it's a slippery slope. Like you, if you don't know how, if you don't uh, engage critical thinking, you might get it yourself into that trap. Yeah, I guess. Um, first of all, I don't think we should ever like idolize any gurus, like where oh everything this person says is true. No, <laughs> right? Like everything that person says is true for them. <laughs> It's not necessarily true for you, okay? So for me, a lot of times when I when I look at these guys, I take away the information that was meaningful for me. Like I know that that was meaningful for me. I can apply that to my life. I know that makes sense, right? And then there's a lot of things that that person says that I don't agree with, or something like even Gary Vee, right? I don't I actually don't agree with more than half of what Gary Vee says, but there are certain things that he says I. I agree with, right? Like Andrew Tate, right? There are certain things that he says I agree with and there's things that he says I don't agree with. And I, I really think we need to decide for ourselves what that is. And, and, and then once I do that, that makes me me, right? And then somebody watching me is going to take away some, some, something from me. And it's like, that's what really personal brand really is. Is yeah. right now, if I go watch the news, right? First of all, like on, on, like, you, you know, like we all watch in the old days, we watch CNN or whatever that they give you, right? Uh, Fox or MSNBC or whatever. And now, like, there's a lot of independent media on YouTube, and there's, and then over time, like, I, I've been following this journalist, but then, like, out of nowhere, this journalist says something stupid, like, I, that I don't agree with. And then, like, some, right? So I know that, like, okay, I can't fully trust this guy because I know his opinion is like this or something like this, which I don't agree with, right? But then, like, the, there's this other person who I, like, for example, one of the news, like, for me, I get most of my news actually from this comedian. His name is Jimmy Dore. And the reason why I get it from him is because the way he tells the news is he just reads it. Like, he doesn't, like, say that's wrong, blah, blah, blah. He reads it. And he's like, oh, this is what they're saying. This is what they're saying. It's like, well, like, and, and then he just breaks it down, like, in, in a layman's language. <laughs> You know, like so, and so that we can decide for ourselves, right? But he'll never, he'll never be biased, 
right? <laughs> like if it's like something, if it's something he says wrong, the next day he'll be like, oh, actually, what I what I said yesterday was wrong. It was uh, it was a <laughs> uh, information that I got that that turned out to be wrong or whatever it is. Like he's very honest, right? So therefore, like I trust him, right? And that's the personal brand. And then there's journalists out there that I don't trust at all. Like er- everything that comes out out of their mouth seems like a lie to me. But then there's going to be yeah. somebody else who <laughs> trusts them, right? So I, I think that's what really a personal brand is, is that here's a perfect example. Yeah, Crystal is the man, but it's not always mm-hmm. right. Meaning yeah. it's right for him because he has a very logical, conscientious personality, not up and down emotional like me and like, you know what I mean? Like, so that negotiation sales tactic works for him and people like him. But I also not know a lot of people like me who are impulsive and emotional and shit like that, where that tactic doesn't work for them. Because when they mm-hmm. try to apply that tactic to a negotiation tactic with a the client, they feel yucky. They feel like they're betraying themselves. They feel like, they, they feel like they're playing a character. So it comes yeah. off that way. And because if they're like me, I wear my heart on my sleeves. So when I lie, everyone knows I'm lying. <laughs> you understand what I mean? So therefore, it doesn't work for me and it doesn't work for those people. That's why I attract those people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's why, that's why some people actually prefer m- my way more than even Chris Doe's, right? And that's what a personal brand really is, you know? Mm-hmm. Those are my people and those are Chris Doe's people. <laughs> Get it? And then there's also some yeah. overlap, yeah. Definitely. I think I'm in the overlap part, but yeah. <laughs> You just mentioned very interesting thing. And I think when we were discussing about like how to co- tell your stories in short form, like on social media, like you don't bring nuances into that. It has to be black and white. Uh, if I remember correctly, like nuances are not applied. Like it, it's oh, like, nuances. It time limit. Like, yeah, you cannot have nuances in 30 seconds or 15 seconds. Yeah. And I think that's where the discourse is changing. Like uh, people are, I don't know how, I just observing myself like I'm moving more to a podcast, like long form conversation where there's nuances, ton of nuances and short clips of some like off the cliff things, but it's very rare. Yeah. But what I found like the people who are passionate about, they will always source those clips to me. I've observed that in politics and religion and everything. Like they will not listen to the whole conversation. This is always about oh, something yeah. that's aligned with them and they will take the clip and they will send it to me like, oh, you was saying that about this person but he said this yeah, yeah, and yeah. that that becomes slightly dangerous when you are presenting a complicated idea something as complicated as religion or spirituality. that's the problem with marketing yeah <laughs> that's the problem with marketing and propaganda <laughs> yep and that's why like i you know ethics has to be so closely tied to like that's why it's a little bit dangerous right now that it's a wild wild west world where, where everybody says whatever they want like for example I can say, oh, if you take this course, you're going to be sitting on the beach and make a million dollars and you don't have, you only have to spend 20, hour, 20 minutes a week or something like that, right? I can just lie <laughs> and then I can make it sound good and then somebody would, because most people's attention span is so short, so they're not going to go into the nuance, right? And it's, it's, it's like the, it's kind of like what's happening with almost every political issue out there, right? Almost every political issue out there are so fucking complex that when almost almost every time I talk about a political issue like climate change or something with somebody, like this person thinks that they already know everything. When they know nothing, they, they're like, oh, the world's going to end in 12 years. Like, it's, it's, it's not like, it's, it's, it's not so black and white. And what, that is, what that's like is like, imagine you've been working with this client for two years. And you know they use WordPress and they, they have all the and they have this plugin and they have this plugin, we customize it like this, so that when you do this, it's gonna break this, and you know the ins and outs of this entire system, right? And some newbie comes in and says, No, we gotta do it like this, without understanding all the details. That's kind of what it's like, right? And then your the boss actually listens to them because they made it sound simple. So everybody wants the candy, nobody wants the broccoli. So of course, yeah. in a world broccoli is the nuance. Of course, in a world where the truth is the broccoli, nobody wants to listen to it. Like, you know, like, so that's why the, 
it's one of the things that I, I feel really, really, really passionate about and, and feel strongly about. And it's the reason why I want to create an online course that proves all those things, all those little marketing tactics that they use. I'm going to prove all of them wrong. <laughs> so that, so, you know what I mean? And that's, I think that's the only the way, only way I can do it. Like, you know, like the only way, for example, you know, airplane tickets used to be so expensive because of all these regulations and blah, blah, blah. Until like JetBlue, Southwest Airline, all these like cheaper airlines started coming out and they just completely destroyed the market. So now the old, even American Airlines, they have to lower their prices, right? So that's kind of, that's kind of, that's kind of what's going to happen. Like, uh, uh, that's how you disrupt the market, you know, by just making something that really is so good that people can't use that bullshit propaganda tactics anymore, you know? Yeah. But here's, I'll, I'll say think, this. Yeah. You, you ever heard this? Like, you know, a lie travels around the world while truth is still putting their shoes on. All, at the end of the day, I think, ultimately, truth always gets revealed, right? Yeah, when Ty Lopez said, here in my garage, I got my Lamborghini here, but you know, you know, but you know what I love more than Lamborghini? Knowledge. And he shows all the book and that video got whatever, 11 million views. And yeah, but now he's getting sued like crazy, right? So time will always tell. Time will always tell. I, I just don't think, yeah, I don't think that lasts forever. So. Uh, on the counter, I think uh, it's a constant loop. Like these kind of scamsters and tricksters, they always come. That's and true. I think it's targeting a natural tendency of something like getting rich quick or getting something quickly without a lot of effort, or finding a hack of doing something. Yeah, so it's true. always gonna be there. Yeah. So it's it's a tough like, fight. Look at the original Ponzi scheme. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> that was like a hundred years ago. <laughs> yeah. And the structure is still the same and it's out in the open, but still people are, greed is a very powerful thing. Yeah. Do you know the story of the mm. original snake oil salesman? The, no. So you know how like people use the term of snake oil salesman? So the originally like in the US, like 200, 150 years ago or whatever, they, you know, Chinese, you know, there's Chinese immigrants that were working on the railroads and when they were in pain or something like that, they use the special snake. It's a special kind of snake that grows in certain region. And they, they get the oil from it and you rub it and it makes it. It actually, scientifically, that, spe that specific snake's oil is good for healing uh, those kind of, I guess, aches and stuff like that, right? So Chinese people started using it. And then some white guy <laughs> took it <laughs> and then like mixed it with water and then, and then says, oh, this is an old ancient Chinese snake oil, blah, blah, blah. And then they started selling it. And then, you know, because of the whole, you know, the like, what do you call it? The, the placebo effect, right? So people yeah. Are like, oh, yeah. It's like almost like one of those like vitamin nutrition uh, pills that people sell. So people are like, oh, oh, oh. And then at some point, he just stopped using that oil at all. And he just made up some. <laughs> and then it turned out like he was basically selling water or something like that, right? But then by then, it got so big that. You know, and that's where the snake oil salesman, uh, where it came from. <laughs> yeah. Most scams <laughs> actually don't. True. Most of those scams don't start out as scam. Actually, I actually think that most yeah. entrepreneurs, I don't think no entrepreneur goes in like maybe very very few. Unless you're like a uh, criminal, like most entrepreneurs, even Ty Lopez and all those people that I call fake gurus. They go into it with a good intention and trying to, and then, but then they realize that, oh, it's really hard to do it the right way. So they break a little bit, break a little bit, break a little bit, break a little, and then before you know it, they became fake guru. And that's how most scams work, you know? Most scams don't, most scammers don't start out as a scam, <laughs> you know? And I, I used I used to think about this a lot, like, uh... How does a scamster or even a corrupt person sleeps at night? Like, what story does he tell himself? I'm always curious about it. Like, what but does I he tell himself? By then, by that time, they've 
because it, it it doesn't happen overnight, right? So, for example, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna sell like, oh, sell night out, and I'm gonna help these people, right? And then they're like, oh, it's not this this thing is not making money, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna lie a little bit and say you know something else, and then and then okay, oh, uh, but and then they justify like that's why they make up those words, right? Oh, you know, you know why? Because if they don't pay, they don't pay attention. That's why we need to hire a child. So. You tell that story to yourself long enough, you start believing your own bullshit. You know what I mean? And some of them, it's not even bullshit because somebody will tell them that and be like, oh, that sounds good. That, that, sounds, <laughs> that sounds logical. Yeah, if they pay, they but even though the data doesn't show that, they're like, oh, okay. And then now they've told themselves and they're, now they're biased, right? And that's how biases work. Like they did a test where um, they, they give them a, um a test where okay are you pro-life or pro-choice um are you um you know are you for immigration or no immigration? like they give them the, all these different choices and they pick all the ones that like scored kind of like right in the middle like you know what i mean but then like they don't score com- perfectly in the middle some of them are like slightly right or slightly left right and then like a couple months later they have them come back and they haven't answered the same question. And then it gets a little bit farther. Like, oh, first it was in the middle, but they forced them to pick a side. And once they pick a side and they come back, it, it got a little bit farther and a little bit further, a little bit further. So when, when somebody, because t- I've tied my identity to this, oh, I believe this. So next time you come back, somebody says something like, now you're attacking my identity. So I'm going to double down on it even more. And I'm going to, so... I think that's what happens. I think, and then before you know it, they they brainwash themselves and they don't even know it. There's this video going around where this teacher um, shows a bunch of students that there's a blue circle and a, I don't know if you've seen the blue circle and a red circle, same exact size, right? And it says like, oh, this is looks like the same exact size, right? What if I was? What if I were to tell you that one is bigger than the other? And then I said, how many of you guys think the blue one is bigger? And then some people will raise their hand. How many times, how, how many of you guys think that the red one is bigger? And some people will raise their hand. And then he goes, no, they're actually the same size. <laughs> so you see how I brainwashed you <laughs> to <laughs> make, make a choice, right? So that's how easy it is to brainwash people. Yeah. There's something very interesting about... Uh... Yeah, but... Uh... The identity is a very tricky part. Like you have to pick a certain side at some time in the life just to find your tribe. And that's a very tricky thing. Like being a social animal, we want to be part of a tribe. And slowly but surely they will pull you into their whatever group thing that they have. Like maybe let's say there's a new group and they started a new idea and my best friend got a part of it. And since he's my best friend, I don't he's think inviting it's the tribe. There. Actually, I mean, tribe is the why they why they get attracted to it, mm-hmm. but the identity thing is not tribe. What's happening there is, let's say this person is like, and kid, you, you have to look at this. The, you, you know, the, do you know the Earth is flat? Like it's like, oh, look at this data, and then they get they do all of that right now. They, and you're like, what are you talking about, stupid? Like <laughs> Earth is not blah, blah, and then you argue, 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 and now he's like so hardcore told you about this, right? So let's say you go with the data that proves him wrong. You think he's just going to be like, like, oh, shit, I was dumb. I'm stupid. I don't know anything. I was wrong. You think he's going to do that? No. <laughs> he's going to try to come up with another evidence that counter the, contradicts your evidence, right? Because, And it's because I've, I've already announced to the world that this is my identity. I believe, believe in this, right? Because I've announced to the world. It's, it's kind of like... Um, you know, my mom is a Christian and she's she's devoted her whole life to, into being Christian. And his, she's constantly telling me to go to church and oh, well, Jesus will save you and all of that, right? And I don't buy that, right? So every time we get into argument, like I'm thinking like, mom, how can you as somebody with a PhD so smart not understand that there's dinosaur fossils and how can you really believe that (laughs) like the earth was created in seven days by like how can you believe that shit right and like it doesn't matter right because 
in order for her to break that, she basically has to admit to admit that her entire life was a lie. Mm. Do you think somebody can do that? If it's so tied to their ego that this is me, I'm a Christian, blah, blah, blah. And I say, you know what, mom? Everything that you believe to be true in your entire life is a lie. You think she's just going to accept that? No. <laughs> do you understand what I mean? So I think that's why, yeah, I think that's why um, it, it gets so tied to their identity. And that's why, that's why this kind of, so much conflict is happening right now. People don't even try to listen to each other. Or, or they're like, nobody wants to admit that they were wrong. Like even this fucking COVID shit that's happening, right? Like now, even though all this data was coming out against, you know, how, how the COVID vaccines didn't really work and like uh, all of this shit. People who, who talked about it back then, like, they're still not going to be like, oh, you know what? I'm so sorry, world. I was wrong. Like, Dr. Fauci is not going to come out and be like, oh, I'm so sorry, world. I was wrong. They're just not going to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because that, that would ruin his whole reputation. His, his entire identity and his ego is tied to it. I think that's very detrimental even if you are in this field of science and you have this kind of... Uh issue with your identity and issue because i still remember when i we were studying about atoms so there there are different atomic models you have to study like there's a rutherford model there's a other model and as soon as you go to the next model you there's a line like uh, the model you read previously uh, it was found to be not as proven what we wrong. think <laughs> it was proven wrong and i was like so why why, why i wasted so much time learning that model but uh, i think it instilled in me like okay science have this uh, uh, like it accepts when it's wrong and that accepts i almost feel really like important. scientists need to go to that go through that exercise so that they yeah. they they don't get biased you know what i mean oh, scientists have to like scientists have to accept the fact that they they could always be wrong <laughs> like yeah. if you can't do that you're not a scientist <laughs> And I still credit that to my humility. Like I have this tendency to say that like, everything which I know, it can be fake. Everything can be fake. Everything can be just another dream of dream and a simulation. So there's a possibility. And yeah, I think the science was hugely responsible for that. Specifically that part where I found out like, no, so that's, what I read up to this point. Science helped you work on your ego. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, most Definitely. people cannot. You'd be surprised how, how, especially if their expertise is tied to their job and their career is tied to it, you'd be surprised how little, how few people are willing to admit they were wrong. Or even the possibility of they could be wrong. You know what I mean? Like the other day, somebody tweeted like, because like, you know, tweet is like short, so I couldn't. I just couldn't go back and forth. I'm like, okay, let's just, we wouldn't need an entire two-hour conversations to go through this. So let's just dis agree to disagree, right? And 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 this guy, this guy replied to me, "Okay, fine, like because you're wrong." <laughs> yeah, like it's just it's so hard for people to admit they're wrong when all you got like like the other day when I posted um video of uh, how like social media managers don't really know what they're talking about. Blah blah blah. So there are some social media managers that that doesn't grow their own account but works on client and started like so I mean I and and they start like they started attacking me like like this is what they do they started attacking me like oh you have any evidence for that like what what's what data do you have to back it up I'm like no I don't it's this is my personal opinion and I could be wrong I don't care <laughs> like that's all you gotta say because <laughs> then. Then the other person cannot say anything. Okay, like what are you gonna do? You're gonna you're gonna say that my opinion is wrong? Like okay, it's my fucking opinion. It's not. <laughs> yeah, it's wrong. Fine. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, another interesting topic to talk about. Uh, have you played with Chat GPT? A little bit, like once, like a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think it's on a track to be? Like pass that to what? What's the test called? I'm forgetting Touring to check test. the AI. Uh, oh yeah, Turing test. Is it on the path? I think it it already passed the Turing test. No, I don't know. Did it? Did it pass the Turing test? I'm not sure. No. Yeah, I don't know, but 
I mean, from me using it, I I, I want to use it a little bit more because, like, every time I just get more input, 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 I can see, like, what I'm trying to figure out right now with the storytelling part is I'm trying to give it inputs based on how, how I create carousels and how I write. I'm trying to give it input because I think this way, and I would say, okay, can you make it so that, um, can you make it so that, um. You know, there, there's like a, there's a, there's a clear example of that. Can you make it so that um, the myth is something that a lot of people will agree with because the myth isn't strong? Or, so I kept inputting, 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 and I haven't really gone far. But I want to keep doing that to figure out how ChatGPT thinks, at least when it comes to storytelling. Like, why is it coming up when I give this prompt? Why is it coming back with this story rather than writing it like this story, right? So I want to really figure that out. But I mean, I, I, from my experience, just that little bit of using it, I think it's far, far away from like doing any really intelligent things. <laughs> it can probably, you know what? I actually think the, the things that ChatGPT writes is better than most carousels I see out there. Yeah. <laughs> so all the average carousel creators out there, yeah, ChatGPT ChatGPT will write better carousels than you. But that that's it's also the reason why your carousels are not performing. <laughs> you know? And what do you think is it is missing? Like it needs more training or more data. What do you think is missing there? Like what does it it doesn't have? Um, maybe it's experience. Like I, f I feel like just because it's basing all the answers on the average answers of everybody else, it just comes out so dull. Like for example, um, like you know when I give the example of like, uh, that, that that bathroom sign with one with elephant and one with the sheep or something like that, and how you couldn't guess what was women's and what's men's room. And I use that as an example on why design needs to serve a purpose, right? And I and I word it like, you know, or like I might say something like, oh, if you have to explain your joke, it's not funny. But, you know, and if you have to explain your design, that it didn't work, right? Like it can, it could never come up with words like that. Because <laughs> I, I said make it poetic and then it still couldn't do it, right? I don't know. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I think what it can't do is, here, here's what it can't do. A lot, the, a lot of the reasons why I think my content is different from those most carousels is because I've experienced certain things in my life, like that bathroom thing, or or me working with a client where I stopped presenting it to them. And I, I actually stumbled across these examples that breaks these myths that everyone believes in, right? And then I, I can use that example to, to break that myth. But I just feel like ChatGPT is still in the myth world. <laughs> they can't break that myth yet <laughs> with 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 an with an example because I I, I don't know if how many designers out there have ex had that experience where they just started just sending it to the client directly only or yeah I, I don't know how many people out there have thought about these things right because I don't see it on the internet I don't see it on you know what I mean. Like every everywhere mm -hmm. I see it, everybody's saying the same thing. So, yeah, maybe they maybe ChatGPT just doesn't know how to critically think to break yeah. a myth. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I've noticed was this common thing like it doesn't have any opinion or any judgment. And I yeah, think that's true. one of the main factor which is limiting it because it cannot commit to a single thing. So that's why it doesn't try to find any examples of that. Like to prove, yeah. disprove anything or to prove anything. Because yeah. those yeah, those like... carousels are controversial, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's I'm I'm clearly stating my opinion, and I'm what I'm doing is okay. Ninety nine percent of you guys disagree with me, but here's my opinion, and here's how I back it up, right? Like with with this example, and once I back it up, when they see it, that's when they go, oh, I never thought of it that way, because they agree with my example. <laughs> they just don't agree with yeah. my opinion. But they agree mm -hmm. with my example, but my example backs up my opinion. 
And that's what's making them say, oh, I never thought of it that way. But if you can't make an opinion, if you can't form an opinion, then you're just going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, sometimes it's like this, but it can also be like that. That's boring. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? Oh, uh, you know, yeah. like uh, climate change, like it's it's much more controversial to say the world's going to end in 12 years. How dare you? It's much more easier to say that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then once you start going like, oh, uh, actually, yeah. So it has to do with the, the car- carbon f- footprint. But there's also this, you know, there's this also other like, you know, other weather metrics and then there's also we also have to deal with like the fact that in these countries we can't just get rid of emission and there's there's hundred different little nuances to this thing once we start talking about that and then people are going to be like what uh. <laughs> they just want to hear some something controversial that's like i just want to know is it this or this <laughs> it's it's kind of actually kind of sad how how simple people are you know yeah. It, it goes back to that whole propaganda of like everybody just don't want everyone wants the 30 second short nobody wants to watch a two-hour podcast definitely yeah and i think it's a bottleneck for ai to form an opinion because how do we form opinion like there at the basis of any opinion or belief there's a certain thing like morale or something we have a morality or this is yeah, right this it, is yeah. wrong mm-hmm. yeah yeah, so, so either we have to hard code that, yeah. that into. Oh no way! But that that's that sounds like that's a startup of something really dangerous. <laughs> yeah, that's a very tricky thing. The other day, somebody was talking about uh, on Twitter, like attention is like the new oil, right? Like atten- attention is what what's most important, and I disagree with that because of like things like meme accounts right like uh, i can do i can like i can go and i can shoot up a school and i'll get attention (laughs) does that mean you know what i mean so i i I disagree with that and i I just gave you some examples why because i can just uh steal all of the meme (laughs) the the most viral videos and put it on my account does that mean just because i have attention doesn't mean you know like i I, i'm going to be a successful businessman no right so I, I said, what I said was, uh, no, I actually, what, what's more important than attention, I think, is influence. And mm-hmm. then this person said, yeah, but you need attention to get the influence, which is right. So we're both right. And, and that's the thing about most, the most facts in the world are they're very nuanced, and we're both right. And the controversy comes from the fact that, no, my opinion is this, and your opinion is that. And that's what a computer can't do. Mm-hmm. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Like, like but, uh, abortion is like the perfect one, right? Because mm-hmm. unless you go down to a lot of these issues, you can't talk about it without um, defining morality and where you stand morally. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Otherwise, like, because there, there is no right answer. Other, other, like, only way you can say this is right or wrong is what you morally believe. <laughs> And so if a, com- a computer cannot do that, they're just going to give you the facts, which is like, oh, sometimes this is right, sometimes this is wrong, but this could be, <laughs> which is not, yeah. So maybe, yeah, maybe we just touched on a good point is that the, the story and the content that people relate to, they connect with, are the ones that have to do with morality, opinions. Yeah. Uh, do, we, do we believe in the same morals? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah, I think something. This is a very human thing to form to. And I'm still thinking about like where does our morality come from? Like, is it? Oh, that's a deep hmm. question. Deep, yeah, for sure. Because like people, people say it comes from. Uh, everybody defines their own morality, right? But where does that come from? Where <laughs> you know what I mean? So I mean. I mean, that's why I don't think religion can ever disappear, really, in my yeah. opinion. Even the child with, like, finding uh, in epigenetics or in genetical psychology, like, this is how your genes influence you to form morality, then they found out, no, this is not 
so no. that's why like science like they were found like no no we are wrong like morality doesn't like there was a very common theory like uh, in the wolf pack they will make uh, elder wolf like uh, walk in the front because they don't want them to left get behind left behind and another scientist came and mm. it was like no no that's not the reason they want uh, older wolves to in the front because they will be the first to the face the, face the danger and uh, the younger will be safe that way it's not like mm. they are choosing to be in front they are pushed to the front uh oh, so the whole okay, okay. construct of morality goes out like science cannot describe I that. see what you mean yeah yeah and also like people might say oh like how do you know that we shouldn't kill somebody like that the, doesn't everybody know they're born with that but no if you actually if a, a baby is born and that baby is not taken care of and they're just left alone for two years or three years and when they grow up <laughs> they're gonna become so psychopathic murderers <laughs> you know what i yeah. mean like they don't have that morality and that that like that's been kind of studied actually from with the uh, with some orphan infants and stuff like that how uh, how like lack of attention turns uh those those kids into sociopaths because those are the ages where you learn how to charm people that when you smile that they're going to give you milk or whatever it is right so yeah, yeah but like there's some sort of a uh, high level consciousness who will work like that we all like we as a society we decided that what's moral and what's not right kind of as a group because that's why because that baby doesn't know but the reason why they're taught that is from the society so yeah i don't know i've never even thought of actually i probably shouldn't talk about this because i never even thought about this topic we're just so. having a random discussion on this uh, <laughs> anyone listening don't take any notes here but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was still thinking about this what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and it's still uh, when i think about this uh, i was trying to reduce this argument into like what does a let's say a baby want it has the genetic desire for him to survive and to reproduce these are the two base desires every human have have and i think well, they're everything related. yeah reproducing and survival are survive. related because yep. the way survival your genes survive yeah. is through reproduction yeah yeah so i think the morality and everything is just one layer about that like uh, i have to survive yeah. i agree actually yeah. Feed me. yeah i actually think that that's what we call you know the what we call the universal consciousness how how people say there's a consciousness you know in all humans or something like as a group right how how we evolve together I think what that really is is our it's all of our genes like every single one of our genes trying to survive <laughs> and when every gene is just trying to survive it creates wars it creates love it creates all of these every human experience that comes is all from our you know like if you want if you um read selfish gene by richard dawkins yeah. like the way he explains it is like we're we are just a bus that's carrying the genes <laughs> you know what i mean our body and then the genes gonna get passed down and yeah it's a very interesting topic and sometimes it makes you feel like like it comes to hold that argument like uh, everything is everything deterministic like everything is already decided by your genes and everything so should you take responsibility of anything like the whole like we have free will yeah <laughs> argument the sam harris one yep. yeah Yeah, I, I I haven't I haven't thought about that, and I don't even want to because <laughs> I I don't think there's an answer there. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, maybe like if I had to answer, I would say yeah, we don't have free will, but we can't live as if we don't have free will. <laughs> like yeah. we don't have free will, but we have to live as if we have free will. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. that's what I would say if if I had to just guess off the top yeah. of my head. And like everything else, the answer is very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's kind of like that's what it. they say. Okay, like meaning of life, right? No, there is no meaning of life. Like we mm-hmm. should, if we were all logical, we should all be nihilistic an- anarchists, because like w- yeah. what's what what's the point of even being alive? Blah, blah, blah. We should all go kill ourselves or whatever. But no, the meaning of life is what <laughs> we give it. <laughs> Yeah. just like the free will is what we give it like okay it doesn't matter if there's no meaning you know 
but that's why I think Dor- that that's where kind of I, I start to disagree with Jordan Peterson on the whole religion stuff. Like I, I think mm-hmm. I'm much more physics, molecular science than than the religion. Like I, I think he puts too much emphasis on the Bible and the and the teachings of that, you know, the religious text. Yeah. Like but I, I feel like even all of that, all of that religious thing is still based on molecular science and <laughs> physical science, you know what I mean? So yeah, I think it's an observation of seeing all the drama created by your selfish gene. So it's just an ob- observation and you're forming a theory like, I think religion is pretty new, well, maybe 10,000, 20,000 years old, all the old oldest religion. So that's, that's very new in terms of like how long life has been on this planet. So yeah. Religion cannot like... Uh, completely describe what this gene has in its toolkit. So yeah. we're still exploring that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it gets so complex, right? Like a, once, you, once you talk about like reproduction, so like surviving through reproduction, then we need to talk about love, right? And then now we need to talk about jealousy and envy and like <laughs> it, it becomes so complex. So, yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, even this this thing about like intelligence, does it favor for a gene? Let's say a gene has control of all this, like it wants to itself continue. So is the intelligence uh, outcome which gene wanted, like the human intelligence, or it just uh, like uh, what they call spindral, uh, unwanted side effect, which uh, maybe the software yeah, got probably too part of the evolution. It's probably yeah. part of the evolution, right? Because in order for it to survive. You know, we realize that maybe our genes realize that something to do with our brain size or whatever, <laughs> and then, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the whole, yeah. That's why I don't understand people who don't believe in evolution, like, like my mom, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's because like you know the. The argument they always give is like, oh, how come monkeys are not having human babies today, right? Like, the the way we the way we proved evolution is not through empirical science. The way we proved it is through looking at the DNA. And when you look at the DNA of all these species, it literally draws a map of how how the genes are connected, and that that can't be denied. And that's how we prove evolution. Like, not by not because we went back in time and look at a human like monkey like. <laughs> Through anthropology, not, that's not how we determine, you know, evolution. The way we determined it is by looking at the fact that the banana and us human beings share 50% of the same DNA. And mm-hmm. then you, you map that up and it, there, it creates a tree, of the, <laughs> a tree of DNA. And that's how we figure out, you know what I mean? And like the fact that like smart college educated people don't understand that is like mind boggling to me. <laughs> <laughs> It's so simple. Like uh, people think evolution is a step by step process, but it's just a tree and everything branches out eventually into different things. Some and we all learned that shit in high school. Like every single yeah. one of us learned it in high school. Like, so how? Yeah. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> but like, I, I, that, that doesn't mean I'm like dissing on religious people, right? Like, because I think religion has its place too, you know, for, for the things that science cannot explain. <laughs> Yeah, because we still need some sort of a wisdom, right? Like in order to yeah. live life. Yeah, religion has this beauty, and I think science it has wisdom. Described. Yeah, science has no wisdom. Science is just facts, and facts. science yeah. is cold, right? It's <laughs> you know what I mean. There's no, there's no love or anything like that in science, right? <laughs> It's like a surgeon's blade. It will, like, yeah. if you give a flower to it to, like, look at this flower, it will automatically dissect. The scientists will dissect it and keep everything apart and they'll tell you, like, this is the seed and this is the dissection of it and this is another. Like, it will not yeah. observe the beauty of... Food. I guess some of them is beauty, beautiful. Like, when I read the yeah. part about, you know, like, in 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 a Selfish Gene, there's, like, you know, he tells a story of, like, how there's these yellow butterflies that are poisonous that are being eaten by yeah. birds, but birds stop eating that because they realize that they're poisonous. 
but then there were some other but non-poisonous butterflies that happened to be yellow by genetic defect but birds weren't eating it but they were eating all the other colors so somehow this butterfly evolved to have yellow uh, you know yellow color right like when i hear something yeah. like that's so beautiful right like the way ev- the way evolution actually works and how we got here is really beautiful <laughs> so i guess yeah. there's some beauty in science <laughs> Oh, this is so ironical that that your mutation is generally defect in your in your yeah. DNA. Like, Scientifically, that's a mu- yeah, just, <laughs> genetic mutation. But no, I'm just talking about how evolution works, right? Like the fact that yeah. you know, like monkeys with longer tails were like the female monkeys were more attracted to the longer tails, and the, so they started growing more longer and longer and longer tails, like those kind of things. It's just so fascinating and magical, but at the end, yeah. it's science too. <laughs> Definitely, science is very beautiful. If like if 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 a human looks through it, like with human lens, it's beautiful to look at everything. Like I was watching this documentary on mushrooms. I am forgetting. Fantastic fungi. Oh yeah! I, oh my gosh! <laughs> How fascinating is that? Yeah. Like I was like, wow. It is the most important species on this earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I had I had no like when I saw that movie that that movie blew my mind. <laughs> There's so much stress though. How much of yeah. how much those um those fungi like controls are controls us even us <laughs> right yeah. pretty much everything every living species on this earth like you know. Yeah, it's that's crazy. Good, definitely. So yeah, Th- thanks again for this awesome conversation. I pretty much enjoyed every part of it. And please let us know to our listeners where they can find you and how to connect with you. Yeah, so best place would be on Instagram. Uh, it's sun, S-U-N, dot Y-I. And from there, you can probably find everything you need. <laughs> awesome. And thanks for having me, Ankit. Consider- yeah. It was a very awesome conversation. And thanks again for everyone for joining. And see you soon. Bye.